Uh, we have an exciting talk ahead of us, and I'm very pleased to introduce it. The Distinguished Lecture is one of the Association's most important invited addresses at the annual meeting. I am particularly pleased that Pe Pedro Noguero was willing to interrupt a sabbatical that's taken him around the world to speak with us today. But yesterday he was in Green Bay, so I mean it's not that dramatic. <laughs> Pedro Noguera is the Peter Agnew Professor of Education at NYU. He holds tenured faculty appointments in the departments of teaching and learning and humanities and social sciences at the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Development. He is also the executive director of the Metropolitan Center for Urban Education and the co-director of the Institute for the Study of Globalization and Education in Metropolitan Settings. Pedro is the author of seven books and 150 articles and monographs, and you've also probably seen him on TV. He is a regular commentator on educational issues on CNN, National Public Radio, and other national news outlets. He has also served as a trustee for the State University of New York as an appointee of the governor and serves on the boards of numerous national and local organizations, including the Economic Policy Institute, the Young Women's Leadership Institute, the After School Corporation, and the Nation Magazine. So without further ado, Pedro Negro. morning. It is uh, really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Bill Tierney for uh, inviting me to do this distinguished lecture and all the organizers of AERA for uh, helping to make this possible. Uh, I was, I did have to admit that I hesitated uh, when I got the invitation because I am on sabbatical, my first ever sabbatical uh, uh, during my academic career and I, I thought I really did want to use this as an opportunity to start some new work. So in some ways, uh, this presentation does represent some new thinking, uh, particularly after having spent um, several weeks in uh, South Africa, which I'll make uh, reference to a little later, uh, a country which uh, shares uh, some important uh, uh, history, uh, historical examples with our own country. So um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm particularly happy that uh, the theme of the conference is poverty, uh, because I think poverty tends to be this issue that we consistently find a way to overlook uh, in this very wealthy nation of ours. Uh, and not surprisingly, because we overlook the issue, we overlook the people, uh, even when they are laying out in the sidewalks right outside of this hotel. Uh, and so uh, focusing directly on poverty, how it impacts education and society more broadly, uh, is I think a, a critical issue for educators to grapple with. And so I want to applaud uh, the organizers for having focused on it this year. I also want to uh, say that although I'm going to address poverty, I, I want to also highlight the issue of racial inequality, which is uh, related but not exactly the same. Uh, racial inequality, I think, as many of us know, is deeply rooted in our history of, of slavery, of colonization, of racial segregation. Uh, and what's important about it is that despite uh, civil rights and other legislative uh, victories in overcoming segregation, it persists. Uh, and the fact that it persists and the ways in which it persists, I think, continue to create schools that are not only segregated by race and class, but create life outcomes that continue to be characterized in the same way. And I believe that if we, our democracy, American democracy, is imperiled by the perpetuation of these gaps. A few years back, I was asked after, as some of you may recall, President Clinton had launched a national conversation on race that didn't go particularly well. There were these hearings and held around the country, and almost every time it would break down into name calling and very acrimonious. And I was asked to appear on a local radio station. I used to live here in the Bay Area. To, to explain and analyze why, why do these conversations continue to break down and why aren't we moving forward with this conversation? And so, well, that's in part because we don't even know what race is. We're having a conversation about a topic that we don't fully understand because I think most of us would agree it's a social and political construct, not rooted in biology, 
but nonetheless important in defining life circumstances in this country. And that confusion about who belongs in which category and why adds to a conversation that gets messy and hard to manage. I said it's even hard to, to have a conversation about racism because there are very few people who own up to being racist anymore. And so when you talk about racism, you end up fighting with phantoms and, and therefore don't get very far. Said, but racial inequality is something we can focus on because it is measurable, it is clear and precise, and actually, if we did something about it, we would improve the ways in which we relate to each other across these different groups and categories that we still live with. And so today I want to make the same case, that by focusing directly on racial inequality, it's not to reify race as a construct, but it is to say that we, before we move to a non-racial society, which would be a good idea, and that's something I've talked a lot about with my friends in South Africa, they proclaim theirs to be a non-racial democracy, then we have to deal with the legacy of race and racism that shows up continually in racial inequality. And no more important a place to deal with that than in our nation's schools, because our schools are increasingly characterized by those profound divisions that make a lie of all our efforts to create equal opportunity through education. So let me start by reminding us of our history, and our history is that we have used schools in ways designed to create a more integrated, socially cohesive society, particularly for immigrant children, whether they came from Europe or from Africa or from Latin America, our schools have been the place that have made them into Americans. And to be fair, done a far better job than most of the nations of Europe at this test. Because within a generation, sometimes less, children from various lands come and start to think of themselves as Americans. Hyphenated Americans, perhaps. Not full participants in the society, in the democracy, but nonetheless, different from what they were. And schools play an important part in that socialization, that acculturation process. And even today, as we continue to debate over the question of the undocumented and their rights, our schools are the one institution that continues to serve them and it continues to grapple with what it means to enable these citizens and, and children to participate fully in American society. Our schools have also been at the forefront of our own efforts to end apartheid in this country, as you see from the picture, sometimes through force. And when we think about the historic significance of that venture, very much an unfinished one. We realize that by placing schools at the center of this effort to undo a history of racial division, of racial suppression and hierarchy, but not giving them the tools or the resources to carry this out, we in many ways set schools up. And we should be hardly surprised that even to this day, our schools are grappling with trying to figure out how do we actually create schools that are integrated in communities that continue to be segregated? And how do we create schools that are not only integrated in name, but integrated in fact, because children are not being sorted into different classes and have truly an equal opportunity to learn? And these are issues we're very much grappling with. There are still southern towns in this country that have separate proms by race. So the legacy of racial separation is not in our past, it's in our present. And it's one that we increasingly hear very little from our policymakers. But as the conference organists remind us, poverty is also a critical issue. And poverty is increasingly an issue for schools. Because today, our public schools are increasingly all that remains of the social safety net for children. Even those much maligned failing schools, and there are indeed schools that are failing, schools that don't succeed at meeting the educational needs of children by any measure. Those schools still provide breakfast and lunch and heat in the winter and adult supervision and stability in the lives of children who would otherwise have none. And I say to those who would castigate that system that until you have another institution ready to step up and say, we will educate these children, that we better be very careful in how we approach the task 
of reforming and improving because many of these schools have in fact been set up. Set up to fail. Set up to fail because they are overpopulated by some of the most disadvantaged students and too often staffed by the inexperienced, the teachers who lack the resources and skills to meet their needs. And as I'll come back to later, simply shutting those schools down is not a solution. So poverty is, I think, a critical issue that we've got to come to terms with. You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to know that hungry children don't do so well in school. And children who need eyeglasses will have trouble reading. And we indeed have children who are hungry and who need basic services that lack them, and invariably this impacts performance. Unfortunately, we also live in a society that expects schools to solve these problems by themselves. And not surprisingly, schools typically fall short. And when they fall short, they get blamed. And let me be clear, I'm not going to say that the answer is simply more money. Because I work in some schools right now that have ample resources, that have lots and lots of administrators running around and all kinds of coaches and experts, and the still children are still not learning. And it's the problem is not the children. Okay. And I will show you a little later why I believe the problem is not the, the children, because I can take you to schools right now where poor children, homeless children, Children with disabilities, children who are in foster care are thriving and achieving. And those schools and those children are living proof that under the right conditions, poverty need not be a learning disability. But also in those conditions, poverty is not ignored. So I think the real challenge that we face is how to, oh, I realize, I'm advancing my slides, but I haven't advanced any of your slides. <laughs> Those were the immigrant children. <laughs> Give me. <laughs> the racial barriers. <laughs> Poverty's increasing. Schools can't do it alone. Okay, we're all caught up. <laughs> Forgive me. So, back to the issue of racial disparities, because uh, as we know, we've been... Uh, charge, mandate, since No Child Behind has been to close the achievement gap. But I don't think we fully understand what that gap is. And I've been arguing for some time, and many others as well, that really the achievement gap is nothing more than an educational manifestation of social inequality. But let's be more precise of racial inequality. Of racial inequality. Why? Because on almost every important life circumstance indicator from health to wealth, to criminal justice, to education. Disparities that correspond to race appear. They appear in homicide rates. They certainly appear in incarceration rates. They appear in infant mortality rates and HIV rates. Would we be surprised that they not appear in graduation rates and, and in reading scores? Our schools may mirror and reflect the patterns that exist in our larger society, and what we've got to come to terms with is that until we take on a more coherent strategy that not only focuses on schools, but focuses on what's happening outside of schools, we won't begin to change or to reduce these disparities. And certainly, it's going to take more than a slogan. And unfortunately, over the last few years, uh, we've gotten a little more than slogans. Slogans like, uh, education is the issue of the 21st century. They never quite explain what that means. Or that if we simply fire bad teachers, schools will improve, except they can't tell us which ones are the bad ones. Or whether or not that person is bad simply because they're in a bad place. Or, one of my favorites is, let's hold everyone accountable. I keep asking, the people I hear say this, what are you accountable for? We have top-down accountability. Accountability on the people who have the least power. No accountability on governors. No accountability on the state legislature. No accountability on the chancellors. So much of what's wrong has to do with the politics of education and the policies of education. 
the fact that we continue to view education in this vacuum, that we have not created a more integrated strategy connected to, to health and housing and community development. So much of what's wrong is that we continue to blame teachers for problems that teachers don't create. Not to say that teachers don't bear responsibility, but they cannot be blamed for schools and for conditions in schools that they cannot change themselves. So we need to move away from merely blaming and pointing fingers or issuing slogans to really thinking more deeply about the nature of the problem we face. Now, Sean Reardon, a sociologist, economist at Stanford, just wrote a very important essay in the New York Times, which I encourage you to read if you haven't seen already, called No Rich Child Left Behind. And what Sean reminds us is that this gap in achievement is about many things. It's about gaps in preparation. We've known for years Early childhood education matters profoundly. It's glad to see the Obama administration's finally embraced it as a goal, except we all know they have no money to implement it. But we've known for a long time the gap doesn't begin at five, it begins well before five. And if we don't have strategies in place to address the lack of exposure, the lack of stimulation a child comes to school with, then we will see those children at a huge disadvantage, a disadvantage that not just begins at kindergarten, but accrues over their lifetime. But it is also fundamentally about an allocation gap because we fund schools differently throughout the country because of using local property taxes as the way in which to fund schools. And if you read the report, the Equity and Excellence Commission report, I encourage all of you to look at it because it's actually a document that takes this issue on. Now, the question is, what will the federal government do with it? Will it simply be another report that we put on a, ch a shelf, or will it be used in some way to drive policy? Because equity is an issue we haven't heard talked about in years. But the simple fact is that in this country, we give the most to the children who have the most, and the least to the children who need the most. And the only people who say money doesn't matter are the people who have the most money. And as I said, money's not the only issue, but it certainly is an issue. And then finally, we've got this gap in opportunity, and we can talk about gaps in opportunities in so many different ways. Homework is an opportunity issue. You don't have access to an educated parent, don't have access to a computer, you're at a huge disadvantage. Gaps in opportunity are rampant throughout our society and influence outcomes. This is one of the critical points of Sean's article. The rich keep doing better because the rich have more. They can expand opportunities more. They are doing everything they can to ensure that their children get a leg up. Not surprising. The question is, what is our society doing to level the playing field and to expand and ensure that opportunities will be present for all children, not just those who were fortunate by birth to come into a home with lots of income and, and resources. Now, the crazy thing is this. For the last few years, we've literally been in a debate about whether or not poverty is an issue at all. I'll read a quote from uh, an editorial by Joe Klein, uh, Janet Murguria, and uh, Michael Lomax. Janet is with the uh, La Raza, National Council of La Raza. Michael is with the National uh, Council, or no, the um, United Negro College Fund. And they wrote an article basically saying, in the debate over how to fix American public education, many believe that schools alone cannot overcome the impact that economic disadvantage has on a child, that life outcomes are fixed by poverty and fam family circumstances, and that education doesn't work until other problems are solved. This theory is, in some ways, comforting for educators. The problem is, the theory is wrong. It's hard to know how wrong, because we haven't yet tried to make the changes that would tell us but plenty of evidence demonstrates that schools can make an enormous difference despite the challenges present, presented by poverty and family backgrounds. This is the debate we're having. Right after the PISA results were, were announced, Secretary Duncan appeared on Charlie Rose and also um, on another PBS channel saying that poverty wasn't the issue. Something I'm going to ask him about later. My question is, if it's not an issue, how come 
the patterns are so clear and distinct? How come we continue to see that what's driving so much of student outcomes is family income, parent education, and as important, the resources available to schools. So I want to not deny the complexity, but I also am afraid that when we acknowledge the influence of poverty, particularly in academia, that that's where we stop. And we say, well, until something is done about this, there's nothing that can be done. And I have to say that I am as adamant that there's a lot that can be done right now to educate children, even as we wait for the policymakers to get it right. And even as we wait for some administration to launch a new war on poverty. That is, our children can't wait. And the good news is that there are schools around the country that aren't waiting right now, that are trying to figure out on their own, how do we, how do we mitigate some of the effects of poverty? How do we create schools that can begin to break the cycle of poverty across generations? There are schools right now that are grappling with these questions and coming up with answers. And let me be clear, let me qualify that. Doesn't mean they've eliminated the achievement gap. Doesn't mean they've solved the problem of poverty. It does mean they are providing their children with a good education. They are preparing those children for life in their communities. And those children come out empowered and better prepared to participate in society fully than they would otherwise. My question to you is why aren't we learning from these schools? And why aren't these lessons more broadly influencing what we're doing in schools and what we as researchers are encouraging educators to do? Because the sad thing is that success too often exists in isolation and doesn't serve as the basis for further change. So let me describe, well, let me just first point out something that uh, Secretary Duncan should also know. Right? And that are, those are the five essential ingredients for school improvement. You know that they've mandated a few years apart of Race to the Top that schools turn around. As if you could just command it. Turn around. And there was an important study written by Tony Bright and his colleagues at the Chicago Consortium on School Improvement called Organizing Schools for Improvement. I encourage all of you to read if you haven't already. And they identified five essential ingredients for schools to improve. And these, none of these should surprise any of us, right? A coherent strategy for instruction, um, um, developing the capacity of the staff to deliver instruction, uh, strong parent and community involvement, uh, a student-centered uh, student learning environment, and leadership that drives change. And they analyzed schools over the years when Secretary Duncan was the superintendent or CEO of Chicago Public Schools. And the question they asked was, why did some schools improve and others not? And what they found is schools where these ingredients weren't present, and invariably those schools were more likely to serve that group of children that William Julius Wilson called the truly disadvantaged, the poorest children, that the schools didn't improve. Now I raise this because there's so much we know about what it takes to improve schools that is not being used right now to assist schools. We actually have schools that have turned around that have gone from low performing to higher performing. Why don't we give educators a chance to visit these schools, to talk to these educators and find out what did you do? What was the work? How did you do it? How did you get parents involved? How did you get teachers working together? How did you get students motivated and engaged? These are the questions that we should be spending our time on, not how do we raise test scores. But unfortunately, we're leaving it to the educators to figure it out on their own. In some cases, they are. So we have a strategy that's been in place for many years now, what we call community schools. And community schools exist around the country. Some places they're called beacon schools. Some people know them as the Comer model, because the Comer model was quite popular at one time. Others call them full service schools. But they're schools that provide integrated services to children and families, where you can get your immunizations right at the site, you can get your teeth fixed there too, you can get after school programs because these are schools that have the resources and wherewithal to respond to the whole child. And the most celebrated of these is, of course, the Home Children's Zone. Right? But not everybody can raise the kind of money that Jeffrey's raised in Central Harlem, as important as that is. 
And there are other groups, like the Children's Aid Society, it's been doing this for longer than the Harlem Children's Zone, and getting excellent results, showing us that when we mitigate the effects of poverty, and mitigating is not the same as solving it. Mitigating means you give the, coat a, uh, the child a coat in the winter so they're not cold. It doesn't mean you pay for heat in the house. But mitigating is a strategy. It's a strategy that allows teachers to focus on teaching and not on the other needs and allows the child to focus on learning because they're not suffering from some other unmet need. And there are models of these throughout the country and I encourage you to, I'll talk, talk in more detail in a moment about some of these because these schools are demonstrating that even when you work with very, very disadvantaged children, you can indeed create conditions where you can meet their learning needs. We live in a wealthy nation. It should be possible to draw on the resources in our communities, from hospitals, universities, nonprofits, churches, to work together to embrace schools and families. And this is the work we've got to take on, I think, much more <coughs> seriously than we have thus far. Beyond that, we've got to think about what role could schools play in as an engine for development in their community. That is, it's not good enough to just focus on preparing kids for college because we know full well not all kids are going to college. And even if they do go, many of them will have to work through college. So they don't have skills that they can use to obtain a job and support themselves. Many of them will, in fact, leave school. The economic imperative of schooling is something we cannot ignore. And there are schools that are using career and technical education. How many of you have heard of that one? That's been around for a long time. The Berkeley Bi East Bay Biotech Academy was started 18 years ago in a partnership between Berkeley High School and Bayer Laboratories. Today, it involves seven high schools, two community colleges, one four-year school, five biotech firms. Students in 1988 were graduated from high school earning $14 an hour in biotech. And it was a pathway to a career, not a pathway to an entry-level job. We need to think much more creatively. We hear all this talk about Detroit is back. How can Detroit be back if the people aren't back? The car industry is back. But the people have been left behind. And the only way the people get to participate is if the people get educated and are provided with access to the jobs that do exist in some communities. So we've got to be strategic in how we think about relationships between the private sector or the public sector, wherever jobs are, and how we go about educating our kids. There's a, hospital, a high school I work with in the Bronx right now. Every student graduates with an EMT certificate. They can go out of school earning $38,000 a year working in emergency services. And guess what? If they want to, they can continue on to become doctors and nurses as well because they've got the academic background that does not limit the option, it expands options. And we've got to think about this because if we don't, what we will find is in the communities that are the most economically depressed, schools will simply continue to fail. And the only message to the children is, will be leave town. That's the message in Buffalo. That's the message to be thanked in the whole state of West Virginia. Leave, because there is no job for you in West Virginia or in Buffalo. And the only way we're going to change that, if we're going to continue to have people living there and schools operating there, is if we start to think much more creatively than we do now about these connections between school and work. We've got to spend much, much less time focused on drilling information into kids' heads and much more time on empowering them as learners, on getting them excited about learning. And again, this is something I know I'm speaking to the choir here. Right? You've been <laughs> saying this for a long time, so I'm not pretending at all to be original. But I will say this. There are 38 schools right now in New York City, the Performance Consortium, uh, Assessment Consortium, that's been using performance assessment as a way to ensure that children have, in fact, learned and mastered the skills needed to prepare them for college. The results show that those students are less likely than students in the regular schools to need remedial courses in college, 
they have higher college attendance rates, they have the same demographic profile as public schools in New York City, why aren't we doing more of this? I was at a school like that recently. In fact, my daughter went to such a school, School of the Future in Manhattan, where every student must do a, <clears throat> an exhibition at the end of the year in a different subject matter that they present to teachers, students, and parents. There are only three great options possible, distinction, competence, or do-over. Failure, not an option. And they work with teachers, revising, resubmitting throughout the entire year because the focus is on real evidence of learning, not simply how well you did on the standardized test. And when you go to schools like these and you see kids deeply engrossed in what they're doing, so engrossed they're not looking at the clock, they have to be told, okay, it's time to stop. You know they've done something right. And again, my question is, why aren't we doing more of it? And why aren't we focused much more on empowering our students as learners, rather than trying to use fear as a motivator, fear of failure? When I was doing uh, work at, in high schools in Boston, we found that many of our students, particularly the ones who've already failed, are not, fear is not a motivator. Not a motivator. What they need is hope. What they need is the an, a recognition that through education they can, in fact, change their lives, help their families, improve their communities. That doesn't just happen by going to school. Those connections have to be made. And again, there are schools that are indeed making them. This is another organization right here in Sacramento, Sacramento Area Youth Speaks, works with the most disadvantaged kids in the Sacramento area, uses spoken word and poetry to get kids writing. It's amazing to see kids who otherwise appear to be so unengaged enter one of these classrooms and by the end they're writing it. What's really amazing is watching their teachers watch them. Because very often these are teachers who didn't believe it was possible to see these children doing this kind of work. And why are they so motivated to write? Because they're writing about their lives. They're using literacy to express themselves. And I just cite this because I could cite so many others, and many of you are working on projects like these that tap into that intrinsic desire to learn in children. But this is, in fact, what we need to make more available. And I know that we're working against the stream because many educators are afraid of trying to do these things because they're afraid that this, it won't lead to higher scores and their jobs will be in jeopardy. But what I'm also seeing is that in schools where there is those five essential ingredients are in place, <laughs> good leadership, teachers working together, they're willing to take the risk. They're willing to take the risk and make sure that children actually get that opportunity to use knowledge, not just to get to college, but to change their lives. Our kids need to believe that knowledge is power. And I don't think that that's something that they're learning in many of our schools today. Finally, I want to take you to South Africa for a moment, because I was there in the Eastern Cape in the townships outside of Port Elizabeth. And what I saw there, I thought was truly amazing. Because we talk about poverty, well, we have poverty of a different order in the Eastern Cape. Schools where there's no water, their parents have to literally bring buckets of water so the toilets can flush, where there's no electricity where children are coming to school sick. And what this network of schools outside of Port Elizabeth is doing now, that's working with Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University and the Center for the Community Schools, is creating a network so that principals and teachers work together to problem solve because they realize the government is not helping them. Government is the problem. And these schools also realize that they have a, a, a critical resource that they can tap their parents. And in these schools now, there are over 80 parents a day volunteering to do everything from grow food in the garden so children eat, to staffing the um, health clinic, to making sure every teacher has a classroom aid. We even have parents there who are trained to go do home visits to parents suffering from AIDS, to clean the house, cook the food, so the children get to school. And what was so amazing to me is that no one gets paid, and I kept asking, you don't get paid, why do you do it? He said, because these are our kids. And one parent said, because I wasn't doing anything anyway. And now I'm a part of something greater. 
And what they're finding is that they can marshal the resources of the community. They can use social capital to transform schools even without the extra resources. We can't simply sit back and say we need money. We do. But we have so many other resources that we can tap and should tap to begin to have an impact. So if they can do it in South Africa, the Eastern Cape, I know we can do it in just about any community in this country. And we should not wait for the government to lead us. Now, I've been part of a, a group of people, for policy advocates, for several years now called the Broader and Bolder Approach. So we've been advocating that we need a change in policy. We said that at the minimum, we need three things. We need expanded health care, expanded preschool, and expanded learning opportunities, after school, summer school, none of which seems that radical, does it? In fact, Arnie Duncan signed on and said, I support that too. But no sooner had we released this manifesto calling for this was we thought Congress was going to reauthorize No Child Behind, then another group stepped forward. This one headed by Newt Gingrich, Joel Klein, the former chancellor of New York City, and the Reverend Al Sharpton, an odd collection of bedfellows, if I ever saw one. And they said poverty is not the issue. The issue is standards and accountability, and anyone who says it is an issue is making excuses. Now, the administration has, and I want to give them credit, for what they're doing right now to expand health care. In fact, I was asked, what is the most important accomplishment of this administration in education? I said it's the expansion of health care for children. I also think that if they can get some traction on the expansion of preschool, that will be a huge victory. But so much of what's in Race for the Top is nonsense. It's simply no child left behind, rehashed. And I'll be more precise about why it's nonsense. It's nonsense because we are not building capacity in schools. You know, I spent uh, about a week in Canada with the Ministry of Education. Toronto has made more progress than any urban district in the world in closing disparities, addressing issues of poverty. Why are we learning from Toronto? They're also not afraid of bilingual education up there. It's a more comprehensive strategy. It's not simply telling a school to improve. It's going and saying, what needs to improve? What needs to change? And being much more targeted, much more strategic in going about the work of improving schools. And Toronto has seen steady improvements in its schools. We should learn from Toronto. And we should learn from those schools that are doing it. Schools like Brockton High School. Brockton High School, the largest high school in Massachusetts, 4,100 kids, working class town in, in 1997. When they knew the MCAS was coming, the state exams were coming, the teacher said, if they, when that exam comes, over 50% of our children will fail. Because the vast majority were reading at a third and fourth grade level. And Massachusetts exam was more rigorous than any other exam in the country. And a group of veteran teachers got together and said, the only way our kids will pass this exam is if every teacher is trained to be a teacher of literacy, regardless of what subject they teach. And they worked at it for the last several years. By 2002, when the first exam was admitted, administered, over 80% of the students passed. By 2006, 90% passed. Brockton today is the only, Brockton High School is the only urban high school in the state that gets a level one rating by the state of Massachusetts. One third of the senior class in 2013 qualified for the state scholarship to go to any public university. One third, and of those students, one third African American, one third Latino, one third low income whites. Why aren't we learning from schools like Brockton? Why aren't we learning from schools like PS28? In New York City, we have very fancy names for our school. <laughs> PS28 is out there in Bedford Stuyvesant school where 40% of the children are homeless, 40%. It's a full service school. Because the principal has forged a partnership with Downstate Medical School, so there's a dental, a dentist who visits, optometrist who visits once a month, parent education, so parents can get their GED at the site. They get job training at the site. I sat in on a workshop conducted by two social workers on how to respond to the social and emotional needs of children for teachers, 
I asked the principal, why are you doing this as a form of professional development? He said, until I did, my teachers were referring far too many children to special education. My teachers had to be more skilled to work at a school like this. That's capacity building. Every classroom I visited had five adults present. I said, where are you getting all these teachers from? He said, only two of them are teachers. One is a special ed teacher, the other is a regular teacher, the others are parent volunteers in every classroom. Last year, PS28, highest gains in literacy in, in New York, in Brooklyn. So again, we have examples of success. My question, my challenge is, why aren't we learning from these examples? Why aren't we helping schools that are struggling to understand the problem is not their children, the problem is not the parents, the problem is the way we've approached this work. We cannot simply complain or critique or point fingers at the government. I, as you've heard, I do a fair amount of that. But I'm not willing to stop there. Because I think we have to do much more right now, and there's a lot more that we can do right now to provide children with a quality education, to provide practical assistance to educators who are on the front line of trying to figure this out. We cannot pretend in this wealthy nation that we won't be able to do this better until we have some other president in the future. Let us also be mindful of this, that this country is in the midst of a monumental change. Right now, the majority of babies born are children of color. And by 2041, 43, there's debate about exactly when the whole country will be minority majority. Now, when that data is put out there, it often kind of sends a chill to the crowd. Like, what does that mean for us? Well, it should put a chill to us, because what it means is that the children that we're not educating are going to be the children going to be the majority of the people running this country. You know who should be really scared about this? Old white people should be scared. Because their retirements, their social security is going to be dependent upon these workers being gainfully employed to support them in their retirement. They should be the strongest advocates of public education today. Our democracy is imperiled unless we understand that we are connected to each other, unless we understand that immigration continues to be a source of strength for this country. They're finding a way to get people out of the shadows and into society and educating their children is in our national interest. We have been mired in debates that make no sense, that keep us stuck and prevent us from solving real problems. As educators, as faculty with tenure, we've got to be much more outspoken, much more involved in these critical struggles about our democracy and its future. This is a picture of children in Philadelphia who are protesting the mass closure of schools, a strategy that Arne Duncan started in Chicago that's now taken off in New York and Philadelphia and many other schools, different places. And you look at the communities where these schools are closing, they're being closed in the poorest neighborhoods. Think back to what I said before, even failing schools provide stability. Our job is to help those schools to get better. Our job is to build their capacity so they can meet the needs of their students. Our job has got to be to tell the policymakers, learn from success, stop pointing fingers, Start problem solving and recognize that what's at stake here is the future of this country. The future of this country will be determined by what's happening in schools right now. That's a scary thought when you visit schools. But I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because I go to enough schools where I see teachers and children and principals who haven't given up, who are working right now to have an impact and to make a difference. My challenge to all of you is to make sure that we're part of that work too, and not simply complaining about what's happening on the sidelines. Thank you.
Uh, Bill told me we do have time for some questions, and there's a microphone there. So if you, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Us old black guys have to do it too. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> don't wish that on me now. <laughs> I don't think that's a very good job, actually. <laughs> Colleagues and say, no, no, the place to be is out in the street making speeches and, and be an activist. Could you comment on the relationship between scholarship and activism? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think um, scholarship, and we've got all the adults here, I think scholarship without activism is a lot like masturbation. I think, I think what it does is it makes you feel good, but it doesn't produce anything. Um, I'm really concerned about too many of us sitting back, reflecting on our work, doing the statistics, publishing it, and then going home. I think we need to be out in the streets, and we need to take it to the streets. Your comment. All right, so um, I, would, I share your, I think, your concern, your cynicism about some of what we do in academia in the name of research. And sometimes I think it's, it's really for our own career advancement. And, and in a field like education, I would say if, if, if we are not having an impact on schools, then something is clearly wrong with this whole enterprise. Um, and so, but, so I, I do think that there's a variety of ways in which we can have impact. That is that some of the research we do, whether you're a statistician or a historian or a philosopher, can be made relevant to schools. Right? One of my good colleagues at, at NYU, Harvey, I mean, Robbie Cohen, is a historian. He goes out in the schools and works with history teachers about how to bring primary sources into curriculum to make history come to life for kids. So I think there's ways in which we can use our intellectual resources and our positions of privilege in the university to be engaged and to be of use to our field much more than we have. And there are many, many varieties of ways to do that. But I, I, I agree, absolutely. If, you know, schools of education are in trouble. I don't think I'm saying anything new, right? <laughs> and why are they in trouble? They're in trouble because people believe they're the problem. And the only way we cease to be seen as part of the problem is if we are working actively on the solution. Now, that will also mean some political trouble for us, too. But I'd rather risk that than to be simply sitting up on our comfortable offices um, and then find, suddenly find that the School of Education has been shut down because no one thinks it's worth it. Um, my question is about um, what we do as educators when we've done everything right. Like when we have students of color who have gone through all of the stages and overcome whatever obstacles and have become educated and then to go out into a society where their blackness is muted, um, it mutes their education. And, and there are not enough jobs to absorb even those who have gone through the right processes and there's still so much discrimination that the percentage of people of color who are educated and unemployed is so much higher. Um, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that? That part is really frustrating for me. Yeah, no, I, I, that's a very critical question. I think as you spoke, I started thinking about Stockton, California, right? What, the largest city in the country to go bankrupt. So many people lost their homes there, no jobs there. How do you educate kids in Stockton and tell them that you, you shouldn't leave? Right? That there is something here in Stockton for you. How do you do that in Detroit? How do you do that in many other parts of the country? So I, I think the only thing I have seen that begins to address that critical question is when educators are, in fact, engaging the young people in a kind of problem-posing education about how can we, in fact, use these skills to address our basic needs in our community. Uh, I'd encourage you to read the work of Grace Lee Boggs in, in Detroit, who's been writing about this, about what's possible right now. Um, and I, there's a, 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 a TED talk by a guy in Los Angeles uh, called Gangster Gardener about the importance of bringing uh, organic foods into um, economically depressed urban areas. And what I find inspiring about it is they are demonstrating that even in 
depressed areas, there are opportunities that can be created. That you can use knowledge and education as a way to both serve needs, such as the need for food, or in the case of Grace Lee Boggs, the need for energy and homes, but you can also create jobs, generate jobs through that kind of work. So I don't want to be trite about this. I, I, I want to acknowledge this is very difficult. These are major obstacles. But to me, this is the stuff we should be working on and we should be grappling with. If you work in these kinds of communities, you must do these address these issues. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. There are individuals who are seasoned, who are educated, who are of color, who um, are not getting employment, what is to be done about them? You know, I, I, I don't think I have answers for all the questions now. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, we, I, I, the barriers related to race are still very much alive and well in this country. Okay? Um, and, uh, you know, some would argue that, and have argued that there are jobs in certain sectors. It's a skill match issue. Like you have jobs in the growth sectors, like uh, finance and and um, and in technology. I'm on the. I work with a group called Year Up that is trying to address what they call the opportunity divide to, to try to address this this issue. But there's no simple answer to that question. There are a lot. There are in fact lots of people who are skilled and educated who can't find work. Um, many of them are, have been willing to move to go where jobs are, um, but this is a structural problem that goes well beyond um, this particular administration. And um, I, I'd say it's something that uh, is, is eating away at the heart of this country because it's far too many people now in this situation wallowing in unemployment for far too long. And uh, it's an issue that's going to affect us for many, many years to come because of it. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is about uh, some of your work with uh, black and Latino males, specifically black males. So when you think about or your, in your work on looking at black male academies, K-12, what are some of the, what is the data showing in terms of their effectiveness and what are the characteristics? I mean, I assume those five that you mentioned play a role, but are there any others that make some black male academies more successful than others? And is, are there any that um, take sort of a, a psychosocial approach? and that understanding the development of black males, masculinity, and how it plays out in the modern era, is that taken into account in some of these academies? Well, I would say that um, the, the record on these academies is mixed. Some of them are good, many of them are not good. Uh, and, and so I would, I'm always skeptical when people present that the solution to serving or saving our kids is to segregate them, put them all together, right? Uh, prisons do that too, and they're not exactly something we want to hold up, right? At the same time, if you look at the ones that are good, I look at a school like Urban Prep in Chicago, which has had an excellent track record of sending kids to college each year since it's open and now it's expanding, they do have other ingredients besides those five essentials that I spoke about earlier. Um, they have great mentorship from community partners to, to provide these uh, young men with additional guidance. They are teaching some of the uh, social and emotional uh, skills that, that young men particularly need to be able to, to work in groups, to be good listeners, to, uh, to work well with other people. Uh, and I think that is a part of the success. Uh, many of them have what uh, my good friend Teresa Perry called a kind of counter narrative that's, that permeates the school, that is telling them that they are part of something greater, that, 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 that is sending a message to them of, uh, of their importance at a kind of existential level and building confidence and building leadership and building a sense of social responsibility. So when I look at, at these schools that are succeeding, it is less about the fact that they're all male than it is about this ethos they've created uh, to meet their needs. As you heard, I'm also on the board of the Young Women's Leadership School. And those schools are excellent. I would say that the, the male schools need to look at what they're doing because they are really succeeding at, at, at providing quality education to many young women who are coming from very disadvantaged communities. And again, it's less about the single sex than it is about the larger ways in which they engage and work with these young people and get them to both get the skills but also to believe in the power of education to change their lives. So 
Um, there are good models, and I'd be happy to share others with you as well. Hi, I'd like to thank you for your talk, which I found truly inspirational. Uh, I'm at Drexel University in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, and I'm involved in several initiatives with the School District of Philadelphia, both to train school librarians and to work in um, uh, West Philadelphia School, which is, West Philadelphia is a pretty um, needy part of the city. and. I'd like you to speak a bit, if you would, about some of the kinds of problems that urban districts like Philadelphia face. There's not only the fact that the school district is now bankrupt and that schools are closing because the city can't afford to keep them open. I have students who are graduate students, my graduate students, who are in schools where the violence is really significant. Um, uh, there is a, a, an elementary school, the principal chastised a boy for bullying or fighting with somebody on the playground. The father beat up the principal as a response to his, you know, chastising his son. I think these problems are, are huge and, and the involvement of parents is I think critical, and of those five factors you mentioned, it's that parent involvement that is the one of the five that schools have the least control over. So if you could talk about that context a bit, um, that would really be helpful to me. Sure, and it's, you know, again, a, a big question that would deserve a lot more time, but I've also spent time in Philadelphia working with some of those high schools, and I'm, I'm very familiar with the violence that you described. One of those schools that we work with had a lot of interracial violence in particular, which um, was uh, completely undermining the ability of anyone to learn and to, to focus. And, but what, what we realized and, and is that the school, what they, they responded with security. We got to the school and now there are 13 policemen in the building, there's metal detectors. Meanwhile, the violence is still occurring outside of school. Um, because they haven't even begun to create a climate for learning in the school. So, so part, I would say we've got to focus both on how to do that. How do we create a climate in our schools where children feel known, respected, where they can know each other, and where they are part of a community? And then how do we engage not simply the parents, but the broader community in supporting the school? So I think it's a mistake to only focus on the parent. We should. But I, the churches, nonprofits, there are other allies out there that we need to engage in the conversation because a lot of times they have a better sense than we do as educators about what's going on in the community. Uh, good friend Steve Leonard ran a school in Boston several years ago, Dorchester High School, that had lost accreditation. Lost accreditation because parents got so fed up with the poor performance of school, they reported to the state, state agreed, said you can't give diplomas here anymore. They sent in Steve Leonard, a successful middle school principal, to lead the school. Steve says, I've been set up for failure. But he's smart enough to realize that the same parents who reported the school are his allies. So he goes to meet with them and says, you want the same thing I want. We need to work together to create a better school. And the first thing we need to do is get resources in here to improve the way this place looks. And they did. And, and, and part of what they did along the way was engage the community. They engaged the uh, Nation of Islam to get a, a truce, a gang truce, so that the school was not overrun by gangs anymore. He went way outside the box to think about who he needed to work with to ensure that he could educate kids in a safe climate. And that school did, in fact, turn around. So there are examples, again, that we can learn from. It doesn't mean that this is not like following a recipe in a cookbook, where you just mix in the ingredients and voila, you too will have success. It is hard work. Right? And, and you don't always, you're hoping that you'll get an ally who will work with you and, and sometimes the communication breaks down. But I would say that we can learn from those examples of how they've approached it um, under very similar and also very difficult conditions. And I think it could help us in a place like Philadelphia. Hi, Professor. It's always great to learn from you. Um, Perfect segue, because I came to meet with you about Philadelphia. 
just last year, I think, or so. Right. <laughs> um, and so I, I actually wanted to ask if you could um, expound on what you meant by it's a structural issue, mm. and perhaps speak um, when, you, when you help us to understand structural issue um, <laughs> in five minutes or five seconds or less. <laughs> I said that could be any easy question. You know, <laughs> I'm going to try to narrow it down real right. quickly. Could you please? Um, think or help us to think through the centrality of discipline and punishment, particularly yeah. of black students yeah. within that structural issue. <laughs> ah, okay, uh, give it a shot. Um, That's what happens when you're wise. <laughs> so I, I, the easier way to, to, to answer the structural question is to point to um, people who I think done a very good job at kind of explicating it. People like William Julius Wilson and others, Doug Massey, who really talked about how the way in which the political economy of our society has, has evolved has resulted in urban areas in particular becoming deindustrialized right, and um, in a permanent condition of depression. Uh, and this is the reason why even as the car industry recovers, Detroit does not recover. Right? And we have to understand that because um, there's been no commitment, and this is where education becomes so important, to ensuring that the people who are there participate fully in this recovery. And this is, again, I would fault the administration on the lack of foresight on this. Uh, with this particular reference to the issue of discipline and this, what I call and others call this school to prison pipeline. Right? Because as we all know, we are in a state of mass incarceration. We've been in this phase for the last 30 years in this country. Michelle Alexander has documented it very well. Um, Mass incarceration becomes an inevitable result of these of, of this these, the structures that we've created and the and and the policies that have um, failed to address the need to integrate and include people into this changing economy. Um, now it is I, I, we have to acknowledge it's a costly failed policy. I mean to incarcerate people at the level we do over two million people behind bars in this country now. Um, means that that's money that we don't have for health, for education, for everything else. But we become fixated on it because of fear of crime, which drives it, um, particularly as it relates to urban areas again. Um, and so it, we are, find ourselves in a political bind. So California is a case in point. It's collapsing under the weight of its prisons. I mean, when I came to California as a, as a new graduate student, community colleges were free. UC Berkeley was $700 a quarter. I keep saying before I left, why not pay teachers what you're paying your prison guards? Right? Already by the year 2000, the, 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 the California prison system was getting more money than the University of California and all of higher education together. So if these are political choices that coincide with these structural changes that have gotten us to where we are, now the question is what do we do? Do we just say, well, it's inevitable, it's um, not much can be done until we change the structure? Well, we need to work on changing the structure, but we also need to point to how to make some changes right now. And, and there, you know, there's a group called Homeboy Industries. I don't know how many people are familiar with them. that has been working with the recently incarcerated in LA to provide skills so that they don't just return back to prison. I mean, there are examples around the country, small, that work with the most disenfranchised populations and demonstrate even within these structural constraints, there are possibilities. Right? That's the reason why I came away from South Africa so inspired. Because on one hand, you are left realizing, wow, the end of apartheid was a disappointment. Right? Because we did get Mandela out, we do have the ANC in power, but guess what? The townships are full and Crime and AIDS are rampant, and many, many people still not participating fully. But what I found inspiring is that people aren't waiting. It's interesting, I was talking to principals who are protesting against the Ministry of Government with parents and teachers. I said, in the United States, you would be very rare to see a principal out there leading a protest. They said, listen, if I didn't do it, they'd be coming after me, okay? So I am with them, and they realize that their stake is with their community. Right? And so it is in seeing what people are doing under, under very serious constraints, but not giving up, that gave me inspiration, because I see far too much resignation um, here.
Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your comment uh, that race to the top is nonsense. Because uh, <laughs> I'm, te <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm teaching at State University of New York uh, College of Fredonia. Um, I think my question is about the accountability because at New York we have all this Common Core, APPR, and right now we have the EBPA. Um, so I guess my question is, what are your suggestions for college of um, of education? What we need to do because obviously we have to comply for the policies to get our accreditation, but those um, uh, assessment we know is not authentic assessment. Uh, it takes away for uh, the teachers' creativity and all what we need to do for, uh, for instance, like you talked about the poverty issues, uh, but um, what we need to do, I guess. I mean, there's so much we need to do. Um, right now, you know, I keep getting asked by schools, okay, how do we get ready for the Common Core, which is there, because, you know, I'm not against the Common Core. I'm not against the idea that we have a curriculum that, that is shared and that is rigorous and that's, you know, and I think they try to do that with the Common Core. What I'm against is implementing the assessments before you actually prepare the schools and the children. It's, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense, which is what they've done now in New York and in other places. And, and I'm, I, I'm, so one of the things I find is that I'm constantly asked by schools for help. And I, a lot of times it's, it's far away from where I live. And I'll say to them, you know what, I'm in New York, you're in Michigan. You know, I, I, I'd like to be helpful, but they've got great people out there in Michigan who could be helpful. And what they say to me a lot of times, we don't know those people. We've heard about you and we want, and I, so this goes back to the very first question. We got to we, look at this resource, the resources we have at this conference. We've got to be a resource to our communities. It shouldn't be that, that it should be that they can call off lots and lots of people who can come out and help them figure out how to address. And it's not as though we come in with magical solutions. But we come in as critical friends. We come in as thinking partners to work with them and trying to think through some of this stuff. I had a, uh, just a call the other day from an assistant superintendent in, in a community in Michigan that's talking about low achievement and what they're doing. And, and, and I said, she said, we read one of your books about how you address this at another school. How can you help us here? And I said, you know, the real issue is how do you get, generate a sense of responsibility in that school so that they understand that their job is to educate those kids and stop blaming those kids and, and their parents. That kind of work doesn't just happen on a phone call. Though. It has to happen through intense interaction where we work together over a long period of time to reflect on what we're doing and to come up with new strategies to do it differently. And I would say that as uh, particularly faculty in schools of education, graduate students, we have that opportunity to reflect in a way that many educators don't. And so if we can work in partnership with schools um, and help them to see some things that they may be taking for granted. A lot of times these are good intentioned people who are simply falling back on practices they've always known and always done, which then reproduce the same outcomes. Uh, if we want to break that pattern, we've got to be engaged with them in showing how to do that. It doesn't just happen by writing an article and publishing in a journal that they don't read. Um, thank you for your inspiring words. Um, I'm a, a public school teacher in Brooklyn, New York, and <laughs> yay! Yay, Brooklyn! Shout out to Brooklyn. <laughs> and um, in New York, we we have this phenomenon called gentrification, and gentrification has totally um, upset the neighborhoods of New York City, the traditional neighborhoods. And um, I see, and I think a lot of people see, that the um, closing of schools very much relates to that. And the closing of schools has a lot to do with keeping certain populations in the neighborhoods in flux, just in constant change, um, no roots, no security. Um, are you aware of any groups, because uh, it's so hard in the city, because Money in the city is big money, and everyone else has nothing. Um, are you aware of any groups that are organizing, organizations organizing, that are actually trying to address this or do something about it? Oh, yeah. In, in New York City, there's a group of New Yorkers for Better Schools that, that's been doing some of this work, and Coalition for yeah. Educational Justice. Now, there are a few groups 
But um, so I, I would say there are groups that are trying. Um, what, what I also find, because you know, I do talk to policymakers sometimes, mm -hmm. chancellors and people in those positions, is sometimes there's really not a conspiracy going on. Right? <laughs> I know it seems like it from the outside. <laughs> sometimes what's being done is the path of least, least resistance, right? That is, they are picking on the vulnerable <laughs> and avoiding the powerful, right? Now, it has the same effect as a conspiracy, right? Um, but it's different. And, and so then the question is, if the vulnerable get picked on, then we have to counter that with organization, right? And, and, and so there are, you know, there's the teachers' union, there are community groups and parent groups that have begun to organize. And what we've seen in New York City, it's interesting, I'm sorry to get parochial for the rest of the crowd, but Boys and Girls High School has not been shut down. Mm -hmm. Why? That can be very organized. And so the chancellor and the mayor have said, okay, we'll shut down some others, but we're going to leave that one alone because <laughs> we don't want to incur the wrath of that community. So that's a lesson to be learned, that we've got to do that in more places. Otherwise, they will just continue to, to pick people mm -hmm. off. And I, w I would just counter that a little bit, though, because they still need places to move kids that are not wanted in other schools. No, absolutely. And that's and what's happening at Boys and Girls. That's right. And that's why we've got to engage the policy debate. Because the other thing that's happened in New York and many other cities is they've concentrated the neediest kids into yeah. a small number of schools and then said, your schools are failing. Yeah. yeah, you're failing because you set us up to fail. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, and so we've got to also engage the policy issue. And there is a mayoral election now in New York City. We've got to make sure that that issue is being discussed by mayoral candidates yeah. who want to take control of the schools. So, Great. I think it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on successful models of creating community support and building capacity for community teachers. Beverly Cross talks about her teachers when she was growing up in Jim Crow South and in New Mexico. We had, you know, the Spanish American normal school where we had Spanish speaking teachers. They were from those communities. They knew those children. Um, and I don't really like the pipeline word anymore, but there have been some movements to, to work with kids at middle school, high school, to, to give them potential to work as teachers within their very communities. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. I, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like the community school model, is because what it does is it creates an opportunity for those kinds of relationships to develop. Many times the teachers are not from the community that they're working in, yeah. right? but they need to work in alliance with people who know that community, know those children, understand the culture, and, um, and I think it's essential for creating schools that will be responsive to the needs of the communities. And there are great models for that throughout the country. This in Hartford, where there's an organization called Peace Builders. It's been doing anti-gang work, but working now with schools to let them know who the gangs are and how to work with them, because their goal is not, not to eradicate gangs, their goal is to make kid, give kids alternatives to gangs and, give, and create schools that are peaceful. Um, and, and these are all former gang members themselves, so they know uh, who, who, to, who, to, who to talk to and, and, and how those streets work. So these partnerships, when they're forged, can really serve as a way to help schools to become better able to respond to the needs of the community. So um, it's hard work to do it, but it, it takes educators who understand that, that, that a lot of times help is right out there in that community. And we need to figure out who we need to work in alignment with to address some of these challenges we face. Is there a national push or a structural push to look toward citizenship schools to actually put money behind that at this point? Not really. Even in this equity and excellence report, I don't think that got much attention. Um, there are national centers like the Center for Community Schools and others like it that have been promoting this issue for a while, but I haven't seen it reflected in policy. Now, I would say this, though. The Promised Neighborhood Initiative, which was grossly underfunded, mm -hmm. but I think one of the best things to come out of this administration so far has created an opportunity for some of this kind of work. And what I'm seeing across the country is many communities that did not get the grants are going ahead anyway mm -hmm. to create their own Palmer's neighborhoods. And they're bringing together different sectors of the community. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a very red state where people had come together to talk about how to create a safety net for children in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And they were across the churches, nonprofit schools, all talking together about how to work in partnership for children. So it is beginning to happen at in local areas, and we need to, even without federal leadership. Hi, I've been um, uh, feeling frustrated for quite a long time about the whole issue of, of 
education becoming a political football that's getting kicked left and right uh, uh, from one side to the other in, in the sense that there, there's this war between uh, the two sides and, and, and that the, they're both taking school children as a human shield. And, and I think this is, this is part of the reason why we can't get anywhere with anything is because we're being pulled in opposite directions and, and we here in academia are, are stuck in the middle and trying to figure out how, how can we bring the sides together. And it, instead of coming together to, to find ways of achieving these things that you've talked about, which are, you know, worthy things and, and coming from, a, you know, the right side on the thing. I mean, I really appreciate what you had to say, but, but we have to be able to find a way to come from, you know, getting people like Newt Gingrich together with somebody like Al Sharpton in, in a way so that we can find some common ground. So I would agree that finding common ground, um, problem solving, is exactly what we need to do a lot more of. Um, I, would, I would also just warn you, right, that, uh, as a person who has you know, waded into some of these debates, you will get beat up, right? <laughs> You'll come away with scars because it is so polarized. And as soon as you, you know, a lot of times, in my opinion, the truth lies in the murky middle, right? That is that, that, that you, know, you know, for example, the debate about charter schools, either pro or against. Well, you know what? I like good schools, right? And if they happen to be a charter, I'm okay with that. If they're serving all kids, they're not pushing out high-need kids, they're responsive to the community. You know, so, but, but in this polarized debate, we, we tend to not be able to look clearly at evidence, we not look clearly at outcomes for children, and so that's where I think as researchers, we do have to try to draw upon our ability to marshal evidence as we engage in debates. It doesn't mean that, that people will suddenly just fall in line because we can show the evidence, but it does mean that uh, hopefully we can be a voice of reason in amidst some of this uh, rancor that's out there. Um, but you know, I just have to warn you that right now, given I mean, the, the way these education wars are playing out, uh, as you wade in, you are likely to become um, a casualty. <laughs> so you have to have a strong back so that you're able to get up again and, and keep going. Two more, so you get the last two. Thank you. Um, it was a pleasure. And uh, like you and uh, many others here, I guess I also like to discuss solutions. And it's uh, really interesting that you mentioned we should learn from Toronto. And yesterday at my Tatienda session, I said, I suggest that the United States should learn from Canada. Um, I've been in the States for six years doing my PhD in urban education from, from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and now six years a, Cana in, a Canadian. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, you visited Toronto, so I would, I would like to ask you, um, it, aside from the immigration and integration policies that Canada has, and I think United States a state is lacking. And uh, the pay for teachers, professors, it's just wonderful. They're probably on the top uh, paid list. And uh, also health services for all, because health really does matter. What else did you learn in Toronto? <laughs> well, I learned, you know, it's, it's like, it, when you go to Canada, you realize, wow, it seems familiar, yet so different, right? Um, <laughs> You know, there's a reason why slaves escaped the United States and went to Canada, right? Um, because, uh, it, it, and, and you know, a lot of times when I say this to Canadians, they say, oh, we're not that good, you know, we're not that good. Well, just compared to us, you know, that um, it's a, sometimes a breath of fresh air. So some of it is rooted in a culture and a history, right? I mean, you know, the fact that it is, have done, you know, all the universities are public, right? Um, you know, you don't, the people are not paying these exorbitant tu tuitions to go to higher ed. So the differences are, are you know, they're, they're multiple, and, um, and they uh, show up throughout the society. Nonetheless, despite the differences, and because a lot of times that Americans see the differences, therefore we can't be like them, they're too different. But no, I think particularly in this issue of capacity building that I spoke about, read uh, an article by Michael Pollan called uh, Using the Right Drivers. And what he does in that article, he talks about, let's compare the countries that have been making the most progress to the countries that are making the least. United States, for example, and, and what are they doing differently? And what he argues is they're using different drivers. The, uh, the, the United States has been using high-stakes testing as its driver, 
uh, to, for, to improve schools and not making a lot of progress. Canada's been using capacity building as its driver and making a whole lot of progress. And uh, you know, so international comparisons can be extremely helpful for uh, changing our perspective and, and recognizing there is another way to approach this work. Um, so I hope this is a good question to end okay. this on. Um, I am a former New York City school teacher, and I taught in the barrio, so in East Harlem, for those of you who don't know the barrio. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I always found it important to teach to and through my students, right, through a cultural context. I was wondering what your comments are on preparing pre-service teachers as well as developing in-service teachers in a culturally competent way. Mm. Well, complicated issue um, because uh, you know it's it is not simply being familiar with the culture of the children that enables you to do that. Right? There are real skills, pedagogical skills you need to have to be able to address literacy needs or math needs, whatever you're teaching. Um, but I, I do think this question of how do you make the material meaningful, how do you draw on the knowledge that children bring with them, um, is of critical importance. I just finished reading a dissertation of a student who was working at a school in the Bronx, not out in Brooklyn, um, on literacy, early literacy, and working with two new teachers, one of whom came from that community, right? in the same community that the children did in the Bronx, but was still very limited Why? because her training had prevented her from seeing the rich knowledge and, and literacy that the children brought with them. If you treat the children, if you, all you see is their deficits, right? then you can't build on their strengths. Our children come with language, right? and we need to find ways to enrich and work with that language. Um, and so, you know, if we call that cultural competence, I mean, those are the catchphrases we use, and yes, but we need to combine that with lots and lots of other things, skills, that teachers need in order to be truly effective in particularly these very disadvantaged communities, where invariably you're not only going to be focused on the pedagogical issues, but also the social issues that come with it. Um, so it, it's so much um, that, that our teachers need uh, to know to be successful in those schools, which is why if you are in teacher education and you are not with those teachers in those schools, then you're in the wrong field, right? Because how can you possibly prepare teachers for work that you yourself could not do, right? And, and too often, I think that's part of what's wrong here. Um, Linda Dallingham and many others have made the case that we should be doing a very different approach to how we go about preparing teachers, particularly in these schools. And um, I think a lot of it involves being present in the schools with them. So, so thank you. Thank you all for coming.